Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church Friday Night Live message. In today's talk, how does one overcome the temptation to consume products of animal cruelty? So if you know someone who you think would benefit from hearing this talk, maybe someone who is struggling with this temptation, be sure to share that now, share this live talk with them. And if you're watching this after it's already been broadcast, that's totally fine. Uh, you can find that on Facebook. It immediately becomes archived at the end of the broadcast. Uh, or you can go to our YouTube channel, Creation Care Church, where we put all of our sermons, all of our live talks on there. And so if you miss it live, it's okay. You can find it either of those places. Also, thanks to everyone who has been sharing. And if you haven't invited someone to join and you think that they would benefit from this message, be sure to invite them as well. Or you can invite them to next week's talk. So let's give people just a couple more seconds to show up. And also, if you haven't, um, we have a, a Discord channel, which is a, a platform where people have discussions and you can join our, uh, our Discord channel. We have a link on our website. If you go to our website on the sidebar. It's uh, something you can click on and it automatically sends you an invite. And there you can find other people of like mind, have conversations with, participate in discussions that are already taking place. And then once we find someone to lead up our fellowship, we'll have regular meetings where you can actually meet on the audio or video call for that. All right, so the this week's talk, how does one overcome the temptation to consume products of animal cruelty? So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this opportunity where we can come together and learn about your word and get this spiritual encouragement on this very important topic of overcoming temptation. And Lord, if there's anybody who needs to hear this message, that you would uh, bring this to their ears and give them open ears to hear and a heart to accept and uh, eyes to see so that uh, we can all come to a more accurate understanding of your will and also be better equipped to overcome temptation uh, in this regard. So we just pray that you're with us tonight in this talk. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this topic, for a lot of people who are already convicted, already made the change, and are no longer consuming products of animal cruelty, uh, this talk is probably not going to be life-changing for you but it could be life-changing for some other people in your life. So if you have a coworker, you have a family member, you have someone in your church, uh, anybody that you know who maybe they're intellectually convinced or they think, wow, it would be nice to show mercy and kindness to animals, but they're having difficulty doing this for one reason or another. So this would be a great talk to provide that sort of encouragement to the person and equip them with the skills and the ability to, uh, to overcome that temptation. So we're going to go over five main things that you can do to overcome this temptation. And this is uh, sort of a spiritual component, like the spiritual equipment of how to do it. So we can go over a couple of uh, practical things that aren't directly related to advice that we would get in Scripture. But then most of tonight's talk is going to deal with what the Bible says. So let's start by looking at James 4.17. That's the book of James, chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 17. So James 4.17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So a lot of the discussion in the Bible about overcoming temptation has to do with temptation to commit sin. Now, if you were here for last week's talk, we gave all the different reasons for why it is sin to eat animals. But even if you're not convinced that it is sin to eat animals or to consume products of animal cruelty, uh, how to overcome temptation, all these uh, practical pieces of advice still apply. 
So if you know the, do, the good that you ought to do, which is showing love and mercy to animals and eating the very good diet God established from the beginning. So if you know to do that, but you don't do it, then according to the Bible, it is sin. So we don't want to be committing that sin uh, by acting contrary to that conviction of what we know is good. So a couple of sort of pragmatic pieces of advice that um, before we get into the spiritual equipment, one thing you can do is you can veganize your favorite foods, which veganizing means you, uh, whatever recipe you have, you just replace the animal products with non-animal products. And so let's say your favorite dessert has chicken eggs in it. Well, you can use flax egg instead. And let's say your uh, one of your favorite beverages has cow milk. Well, you can use soy milk or hemp milk or some other kind of plant-based milk instead. And if you, maybe chicken wings is your favorite thing to eat, well, you can veganize that by using tempeh or using uh, some sort of textured soy protein. And so there's, there's all these different kinds of ways that you can take your favorite foods and replace them with a plant-based alternative, which would in general be healthier, but it would also be um, not causing this cruelty to animals. Another thing you could do is you could try new things. So I remember before I made the change, I grew up on a diet of like five things where it's like pepperoni pizza, uh, hamburgers, chicken nuggets, and like, you know, whatever else. And so whenever I made that change and decided I want to only eat plant-based foods, then I started trying all these things that I'd never tried before. So all these different cuisines, like Thai cuisine, Indian cuisine, Chinese cuisine, Mexican cuisine. And I found that, wow, I'm actually eating a much wider variety of things now after making that change. And so uh, I would suggest just trying new things. You know, maybe you won't like it, some of the things you try. Of course, some of the things I try, I don't like to. But that would be another thing that you could do to make the transition easier. And then another sort of practical thing you could try is uh, getting advice from experienced vegans. So there are a lot of people who are eating a plant-based diet, and not just that, but they're living a plant, living a vegan lifestyle, meaning they're not wearing animal products like leather jackets and fur coats and things like that, and they're not going to the zoo or to the aquarium. Um, but you know, you can look for alternatives. Well, ask them, what do you do instead of these things? What do you purchase? What do you eat? What do you? Where do you go for entertainment? Where do you take the kids on the weekend? And so just getting advice from people who have already overcome these issues and found solutions, you could borrow some of their solutions. So that's sort of some of the practical advice to make these temptations less of a temptation. Because if you've already found a suitable replacement, you're not going to be as tempted by the things that you would ordinarily be tempted by. But now, for the rest of the talk, let's go over advice that the Bible has for overcoming temptation. So the first piece of advice, the first sort of uh, equipment that you can equip yourself with is to trust in God. And so let's look at Proverbs 3, 5. So that's Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So this is a very important one, and it's the place that we should start when it comes to most things. And if we're struggling to overcome a temptation, then the first thing we want to do is trust in God and to not think, well, I, I need to do this all by myself. No, you don't. God's going to help you. And so first and foremost, let's put our trust in God. Let's ask for his assistance, and he will provide us with all the help that we need. Uh, some of that help might be putting other people in our lives to assist us. Uh, as we'll go over some examples of that. Uh, but the first thing we need to do is to trust God and to not try to do it ourselves. Secondly, let's look at Romans 7. That's uh, Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 19 and 20. So Romans 7, 19 and 20 says, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. 
but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not, will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So this is, might be a little confusing, but basically what Paul is saying here is he has in his mind made up, this is the conviction of what I ought to do. This is the good thing I, I ought to do. But then when it comes to how he's actually living his life, he's saying in some ways what I agree is what I ought to do is not actually what I'm doing. And so there's this disconnect between what he's doing and what he feels he ought to be doing. And so we don't want to have that kind of disconnect. Uh, the psychological term is cognitive dissonance, where your actions don't line up with your beliefs. And so this is something that even Paul here is admitting he struggles with. So if this is something that you struggle with, well, you're not alone, because even one of the most zealous apostles of Jesus was also struggling with this. And there are few Christians, uh, if any, that don't struggle with some sort of temptation. So if this is one temptation that you struggle with, well, you're not alone. And so we want to, of course, look to God to help us with this struggle and not trying to do it on our own. So let's look at Luke 18.27. That's the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 27. And there uh, Jesus says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So you might think, wow, it would just be impossible to change my life in such a way that like, what would I even have left to eat? The only things that I eat that are plant-based are like an apple in the morning and the lettuce on my salad. Like everything else I eat is an animal product. What do I even do? It's impossible. Well, let's start somewhere. Let's start by, you know, switching one of your meals to a plant-based meal. Now let's maybe uh, seek out new things to replace things. Let's, you know, let's ask people for advice. Let's do all these kinds of things to, to overcome this. But th that first thought that, wow, this is overwhelming. It's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. And everything is possible with God. And so this is God's will for us, is for us to show love and mercy and kindness toward his creatures and to eat according to that very good diet that he established in the beginning. And so if this is God's will for your life, which it is, then God's going to help you and he's going to give you that strength. And so it might seem impossible for you to do it on your own, but you don't have to do it on your own. You can trust in God and he will help because all things are possible for God. So with God's help, it is possible. So that's the first thing we want to trust in God. The second thing is we want to, you want to forgive yourself when you fall short. So this idea of being immediately perfect, uh, while that would be great, and if someone can do that, wonderful. But I think most people are not going to immediately uh, be perfect in every way in regard to anything. And this would be no exception. So Forgiving yourself when you fall short. That's an important one. Let's look at uh, Psalm 103. That's Psalm 103. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14. So Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. And if you have any questions or comments, be sure to ask those in the comment. We're going to get to that in the second part of the talk. So here, I'm going to read from the Brian Study Bible. It says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him or worship him. For he knows our frame. He is mindful that we are dust. So God knows that we have weaknesses. God knows that we're struggling with things. God knows what the enemy is up to, trying to tempt us to do things that are contrary to God's will. He's fully aware of all of these things. And he accounts for these things when he says, I'm here to help you. I'm here to uphold you. I'm here to walk you through these things. He's aware of all these weaknesses. He's aware of the strength of the temptations. And he's still here to help us. So we want to trust in him, but we want to forgive ourselves, realizing 
well, you know, I might not be perfect in every way right from the beginning. Now, we shouldn't use this as a sort of crutch to think, oh, well, I'm going to not really make much of an effort and just fall back on, well, God knows that I'm weak. Because it's not just that God is weak, or God's not weak. It's not just that we are weak, that our flesh is weak, but God's spirit is strong and willing. So let's look at Matthew 26, 41. That's Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. So Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So here we have this dichotomy, which is used throughout, especially the New Testament, but also throughout the Bible, of this, the spirit of God and the flesh and how they're at odds with each other. And so we're not supposed to follow the flesh. We're supposed to follow the spirit. And here it says the, the flesh is weak. Yeah, we're going to have temptations and we're going to, and maybe in some cases, fall for those temptations. But the spirit is always willing, is always here to help us through those temptations. And we're going to talk about a few of the ways how the spirit does that and how to look for those opportunities for assistance. But the key here is we don't want to fall back on this idea of, well, I'm weak, and every time I do something that's contrary to God's character, every time I succumb to temptation, well, God just knows I'm weak, and then we just continue and don't make much effort to improve. No, that's like kind of using, using this verse for the wrong purpose. What we want is we want to use this verse as a reason to forgive ourselves. Because we're supposed to forgive not only our neighbor, uh, those who trespass against us, but also forgive ourselves when we fall short. And so we definitely want to have that attitude of, of forgiving ourselves because we are weak. But now let's look at let's look at Matthew chapter four, starting at the beginning. So Matthew chapter four. So this is an example because we're dealing with temptation. So who better to look to as an example for how to overcome temptation than Jesus, right? The one who never fell for temptation, who always overcame temptation. So here he's being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. So it says, Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So this is uh, all of chapter four here, at least the first part, is dealing with this temptation. And he's tempted three times, and depending on which gospel you're looking at, the order of them uh, isn't always the same. But one of the three is he's fasting for 40 days, and so obviously he'd be super hungry. And so then the devil says, well, why don't you make one of these stones into bread and feed yourself? And he says, and he responds by quoting the word of God. He quotes... Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that's Deuteronomy 8.3 that he's quoting. So he's using the word of God as a way to say no to the enemy's temptations. And then no temptation in verse 7. That was verse 4 that we just read. So Matthew 4 verse 7, when, uh, when the, the devil says, well, why don't you throw yourself off this cliff? Because it says in Scripture that the, the Lord won't allow uh, your foot to be dashed against the stone, so his angels will, will save you. And then Jesus says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, or you shall not put him to the test, which is Deuteronomy 6, 16, that Jesus is quoting. So again, even when the devil is trying to twist Scripture to convince Jesus to, to do what he wants and to test God, well, Jesus is like, no. I have faith. I know that if that were to happen, God would save me. I don't have to test it. I already know. And so, again, he's using scripture to fight off the devil, where the devil's trying to tempt him, and he's saying no. He's, he's not, and this is, God, this is Jesus who's speaking, but he's giving us an example of how to overcome the devil's temptations. So he's quoting the word of God, and that's what we should do. And then the third temptation here that's listed is when 
the devil says, all right, Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. All I want you to do in return is to bow down and worship me. And this is what Jesus says. He says in verse 10, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So again, he's quoting scripture. This is Deuteronomy 6, 13. And so this idea that we should use scripture to fight off the devil when he's trying to tempt us, that's the example that Jesus gives us. And we should do the same. We should say, away with you, Satan. And so uh, by following Jesus' example there, uh, we can overcome that temptation. So our flesh might be weak. We should certainly forgive ourselves when we fall short. Don't beat ourselves up uh, unduly for a mistake. But we should not use this as an opportunity to continue following the desires of the flesh. We should instead use this as an opportunity to reach out to God and ask for that help. Because it says there in verse 11, Matthew 4, 11, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So that's what will happen when we use scripture and say, away from me, Satan, and then God will send his angels to help us. All right, so that's the second thing. So first, trust God. Second, forgive yourself when you fall short. And now third is to flee from temptation. So let's look at 2 Timothy 2.22. So there's a bunch of twos in this verse. 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, let's see, I'll read from the NIV. It says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So it's saying to flee from these temptations. Don't give in to them. Don't say, wow, maybe I should fall for this temptation. How bad is it really? God will forgive me. Hmm. You know, we don't want to be uh, contemplating the merits of, of the temptation. We want to just flee from it. There's the temptation, and we, we see ourselves being tempted by it. We think, oh, wow, uh, yeah, that dessert aisle, There's I know there's nothing vegan, but man, that dessert looks really good. No, don't do that to yourself. That's just going to cause you to become even more tempted. Instead, just flee from it, okay? So flee from that temptation, and let's look at let's look at 1 Corinthians 10:13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. It says no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, and here's the important part, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So it doesn't say that God won't give you any temptation. Okay, it doesn't say that. We are going to be tempted. But he's saying that it won't be something beyond what we're able to bear. And the reason is because God will make us an escape. So if we don't look for that way of escape, if we don't exit through that way of escape, then that temptation very well may overcome us. And it may be too strong for us if we're not looking for that way of escape and taking that way of escape. But the reason that the, the temptation is not too great is because he provides that way of escape. And so uh, this creates sort of the, uh, an image in my mind that I think might be a useful illustration. So I'll share it. If you think of a building, well, there's a fire escape so that if there's a fire in the building, then you look for the exit sign that's illuminated and that's your way out of the burning building. So the temptation would be the fire that, that's burning and we want to look for that exit sign. We want to look for that way of escape that God is providing for us, that God promises here. He will always provide for us when we're faced with temptation. So if we're faced with temptation, acknowledge it and be like, wow, this temptation, I, I feel like I'm... I'm being overpowered by it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give in to this. 
look for the way of, of escape because God will provide that way of escape. That's what he's promising here. So flee from temptation and look for the way of escape because that way of escape is the key to fleeing. So if we look at Ephesians 4.27, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. It says, give no place to the devil or give no opportunity to the devil. And so we don't want to just give him an opportunity. If we remember the Garden of Eden, how Eve, when, when the, the serpent was like, no, certainly you won't die. Don't trust God and believe what he says will happen if you disobey. He has ulterior motives. He doesn't want you to become like him, knowing good and evil. And he's like, then Eve's looking at the fruit and it's like, wow, it is desirable. It's pleasing to the eye. And that does sound pretty appealing. And the serpent might be right. Maybe God is deceiving me. Maybe he is holding something back from me. You see, once you've gotten to that point, you know, you're hooked and you've pretty much fallen into the trap. And so we don't want to get to that point by entertaining that temptation. We want to flee from it. Don't even give that opportunity for the devil. We want to say, like Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, and use the word of God saying, for it is written. And then whatever scripture verse can help you overcome that temptation. And we also don't want to fall victim to temptation uh, under social pressure. So that's a, that's a huge one for a lot of people is social pressure, especially when it comes to this particular temptation. So they think, well, when I go to the store, I buy only plant-based food. You know, when I go out with friends or uh, visit family on a special occasion, now that's when it's difficult. And they don't want to stand out. They don't want to be inconveniencing anybody, uh, whatever the reasons are. And so then those are the scenarios that they feel most tempted to act contrary to their convictions. And so we want to keep this verse in mind, Romans 12, verse 2. So Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we don't want to conform to the world around us. We don't want to just fit in. We don't want to uh, not stand out, be afraid to stand out. We want to stand on what God's perfect and acceptable and good will is. And we want to act in accordance with that so that if we do stand out, and we likely will stand out in a lot of ways, then we're standing out and we're being that light that illuminates God's will for those around us. And sometimes that's going to require some ridicule. Uh, sometimes that's going to involve uh, some amount of uh, oppression. And we have to be willing to take that stand. And so when it comes to uh, this temptation, when uh, we're tempted to conform to our uh, social pressures around us to just consume these products of animal cruelty and not say anything. Uh, well, that would be an opportunity to stand uh, for God and to maybe uh, present this opportunity to those around you, where it's like, look, I'm eating a plant-based diet uh, because that's what I feel convicted about, where you know, that's the, the very good diet God established in the beginning. And I believe uh, that as one who has the Holy Spirit in me, I should bear the fruit of that spirit and how I treat everyone around me, including animals. And so by standing your ground and being a witness in that regard, then you wouldn't succumb to that temptation to conform. So that's the other thing is to flee from temptation. And now the next thing is to ask others to pray for you. So that's the next tool that you can equip yourself with. So let's look at James 5.16. That's James 5.16. James 5.16 says, 
Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So here, coming together and praying for each other, whatever it is. So let's say your temptation that you're struggling with is the temptation to consume products of animal cruelty. Well, someone else might not be struggling with that. Maybe they're struggling with, uh, I don't know, sexual temptation or temptation for uh, greed and having mo lots of money. Maybe they're uh, tempted by, you know, whatever other thing they're being tempted by. And so you can come together and pray for one another in these weaknesses. And it says that your prayers will help to strengthen each other. It says uh, the, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. So we don't want to shy away from sharing these struggles with other believers. Instead, we want to come together and encourage one another. So let's look at... Next verse is Philippians 4.13. So Philippians 4.13, which I would imagine a lot of people know what this verse is. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it may seem difficult. It may seem like, wow, there's, this is impossible to do. But just like before, when we're trusting in God, God will give us that strength. And here it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul's talking about all the scenarios that he's enduring as he's preaching the gospel message. He's being shipwrecked, stoned and left for dead, flogged, th uh, kicked out of synagogues, jailed, he, like all these horrible things that are happening to Paul. And he's saying, I count it all joy because these are all sufferings that I endure for the sake of the gospel. And as soon as he's uh, out of prison, he's back to preaching the gospel. Uh, he gets up from the ground after being left for dead, after being stoned, and what does he do? Just goes right back to preaching the gospel. And so this strength that comes from Christ, he'll strengthen us to do all things. And when it comes to living according to that very good diet God established, and showing love and kindness and mercy to God's creatures, he'll give us the strength to do that. It may seem difficult in the beginning, but he will give us that strength to do it. So we don't want to believe the lie that the enemy tells us, you can't do this. Well, even if I can't do it, Christ can do it. God can do it in me. And so I put my trust in God and he will do it. So let's look at... 1 Thessalonians 5.11. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Here I'll read from the ESV. It says, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. So the purpose of coming together to pray for one another is to provide encouragement. It isn't to say, you're still struggling with that temptation? Come on, when are you going to grow up? No, that's not encouragement. That's criticism. Whereas encouragement would be like uh, praying for the person, praying for that, that strength and saying, Lord, forgive us where we fall short, but give us the strength to overcome this temptation that tomorrow is a new day. Today is a new day, a day to, to achieve that victory, that victory that's already been done through Christ in, in much harder struggles than this one. And so uh, certainly Christ can overcome this struggle in my life for me and just handing that over to God and saying, Lord, help me with this struggle. And, it, and then, you know, praying for each other in this way just to provide that encouragement. And so that would be the next tool at your disposal is coming together with other, other believers to pray. And I've found in my experience that, let's say you are, uh, you are a vegan or you're trying to be vegan and you're trying to live according to this, this ideal that God has for us to be toward animals, you can go to other believers who maybe aren't even convicted that they should show kindness toward animals. And you can ask them to pray for you about this. 
And because we're, we're called, as it says in these verses, to encourage one another in the things that we're struggling with. And so even if they're not even convicted that it's a thing that we should care about, that we should care about animals, if you are, and I hope you are, then you can still go to other believers who aren't yet convicted of that and ask for that prayer for this temptation that you're struggling with. And so uh, in that way, you can actually even be a good witness to these people. So what better witness is it than to, to be praying for someone else to overcome a temptation that you don't even acknowledge as a temptation in yourself? So uh, you can not only be yourself being transformed and able to overcome this temptation, but you could be planting the seeds to where they who are praying for you could become transformed in this way. So these are some, some spiritual things that you can do, some tools to equip yourself uh, to overcoming temptation. And now this is the most important one. So well, I guess maybe the first one is also important, but this one's similar. So this one is to be motivated by love, which is very similar to uh, trusting in God because it says in 1 John 4, 16, God is love. So if you're putting your trust in God, you would also be putting your trust in love and you would be motivated by love. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. There it says, Let all that you do be done with love. Or as some other translations say, do everything in love. So when it comes to how we're treating animals, and if we're tempted to consume products of animal cruelty, so these products that require animals to suffer and be harmed or killed uh, in order to produce these products, whether it's products of clothing or food or whatever else, uh, we don't want to be consuming them because we are then causing these animals to be harmed in this way. And so we want to be showing love to these animals. We want to be motivated by love. And so this is also one of the most powerful ways to overcome temptation. So I know a lot of people when it comes to, let's say if we're just focusing on the, on the diet part of it, because I think for a lot of people that's the hardest one. And so if you try to, let's say, cut sugar out of your diet or something, you might be like, wow, that's really hard because I'm just tempted all the time. But when it comes to cutting animal products out of your diet, it's different because there's another motivation. It's not just for your own health. It's for the well-being of these animals. So there's another component that can motivate you. And so if you're focusing on showing love to animals, to God's creatures, instead of dwelling on the difficulty of refraining from consuming them, then that makes it a lot easier to see that this isn't just about me and the difficulty it is for me to change in certain ways. I'm doing this for these other beings who uh, have tears running down their face, who are losing family members, who are, you know, these creatures that are suffering because of this decision I'm making with my life to continue consuming them and their products. And so that motivation to be motivated by love can be so powerful. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So whenever we're motivated by, by this love, this love that is God's essential character, then we're motivated by the most powerful force in all of creation because this is God's essential character and God created the whole world. So when we're motivated by that love, then we can overcome any obstacle. We can power through anything. This, this is the, the power, the, the strength that uh, Paul had to overcome all those difficulties that we talked about in his life because he was motivated by love. And so if we're motivated by love in overcoming this temptation, love for God's creatures, then that will enable us the power and the strength to overcome any temptation as well. So to recap, 
the, the five things that we can do, the, the things that we want to equip ourselves with spiritually to overcome the temptation to consume products of animal cruelty. One is to trust in God to overcome the, help us overcome the temptation, not to rely on our own understanding or to do it ourselves. Two is to forgive yourself when you fall short. So don't make a habit of falling short and fall back on, oh, well, I'm weak. I'm just going to keep failing. We don't want to do that. That's going too far. But we don't want to beat ourselves up and give up. We want to forgive ourselves and then resolve once again to, uh, to overcome the temptation. And then three is to flee from temptation. Don't let that temptation to take hold in you. Don't contemplate the merits of it. Don't, you know, let it you know, bury its seed in you deeply. No, we want to say no and flee from it. Look for that way of escape that God will provide. And then four is to ask others to pray for you and also to pray for yourself. But come together with other believers, even if these other believers aren't convicted of this particular temptation the way you are. Still, come together and pray for it. Pray for yourself and pray for them as well uh, in the things that they're struggling with. So pray, that's huge. And then lastly, uh, be motivated by love. So don't, don't just make it about your own struggle and your own challenges. Make it about love for all of God's creatures and let that be the thing that motivates you to do it. Okay, so if you have any questions or comments, I hope you've been asking. We're about to get to that section. All right. Hi, Brian. I'm Ms. Hunter. Hi, Roz, Lily, Tanya, Angel, Claudia, Kathy. So Claudia says, eating yummy plant-based yogurt right now, cashew milk, vanilla bean. Sounds delicious. Yeah, there's so many, so many alternatives to animal products, especially in today's day and age. You pretty much find a substitute for almost anything that you want. Certainly when I started becoming vegan a long time ago, uh, there was this disgusting carton of soy milk on the shelf, not even refrigerated. And that was, and there was like one plant-based option in the, in the freezer section. And it was just like, there are basically no alternatives other than just eating, you know, things that are ordinarily vegan. Whereas today, it's just there's so, so much demand that, you know, you go through the supermarket and there's 40 things that you could choose from or more. So today, it's, I think, a, a lot easier than it was a while ago. Kathy mentions Guardian products, Morningstar Farms, some other examples. Kathy, so I think people are asking, what are you eating? Spaghetti with beans or with Gardein Italian sausages. Chili with three or four types of beans and Gardein ground beef. And I think she's providing a recipe from Just Egg. Yeah, so again, lots of plant-based options. Claudia, uh, it's either discussing food options. If, if you want food advice... Uh, check out the comments. There's no shortage of that here. Let's see, Ms. Hunter, <clears throat> it is so easy to be vegan when you get to a point where you see all animals as individual beings and not food. There is no issue, and we all should see each and every animal as their own individual person and being. If you feel no desire to eat a cat or a dog, rats or any other animal, or drink pig milk or milk from any other mammal, you have no need for cow's milk or any other animal flesh you've been conditioned to believe is acceptable to eat. That's true. So people think, well, I need cow milk. It's like, well, no, you don't. Do you need giraffe milk? Do you need rhino milk? Do you need cat milk? Well, of course you don't. And you don't need cow milk either. The only one who needs cow milk is a baby cow. So 
unless you wake up in the morning and go, then you probably don't need cow milk. See, if you consume anything from an animal, um, yeah, so essentially we want to be motivated by that love for all of God's creatures and acknowledging that we don't actually need these things, and so we look for other things to consume. Good comment. Let's see, Kathy, uh, we eat those every so often, really good. Let's see more food talk. Let's see, Sharmia, do most apples have beeswax to coat it? to slow down the rotting process and make it more shiny, therefore making most apples not vegan? So good qu good question. And uh, a lot of fruit, uh, including a lot of apples that are shiny, they're coated with something, either coated with beeswax, or sometimes they're coated with what's called lac resin, or um, which is basically this uh, crushed up, I, I believe it's beetles, something it's crushed up bugs of some kind and so yeah there are there are these coatings that they put on fruit uh, some various fruits to preserve it to make it look shinier and yes these would be animal products and it's so disheartening to me how we live in a culture that so doesn't care at all about animals that animal products are just put in almost everything. And as Kathy pointed out to me the other day, it's like, uh, she's just like wishes there, there comes a point, comes a day where uh, instead of looking hard for things that don't have animal products in it, you have to instead look that hard to find something that does have animal products in it. That's really the world that we should be hoping for is a reversal. And I think that if we, if we look at the mindset of people, that's the key. That's that's the thing that if we change our attitudes and our mindset toward animals and stop thinking of them as just a commodity and that they, their lives don't matter at all, and instead we think this is someone, this is someone that doesn't deserve to suffer and someone that I don't want to cause harm to, then all these all these things will will I feel like repair themselves where that's the main thing we need to do is we need to have a different attitude because if we have a different attitude toward animals, we're not going to have all these slaughterhouse byproducts and, you know, things like that where it's like, well, you know, what can I do to preserve the, the shelf life of this food? Well, let's add some slaughterhouse byproducts to it or let's crush up some bugs and coat it. You know, it's like these thoughts won't even come to our mind. We'll be like, well, let's look for a different solution. And that other solution is going to be probably just as readily available or similarly readily available. But since we just don't care at all, it seems, uh, as, as a collective humanity, it's like even when you're trying hard to avoid these animal products, like they're creeping up everywhere. So there is some merit to like doing your best. And, uh, you know, where you draw that line is difficult. Sometimes if it says sugar in it, it's filtered with bone char, uh, and it's like to give it that white color. So you have to look for organic sugar, cane sugar. And so, yeah, it's, uh, again, like fruit, you know, eating apples, looking on the bag to see if it's coated in uh, lac resin or beeswax, or if it's not. I know that some companies, I believe it's Mount Rainier, uh, they don't use any of those uh, coatings on their apples. So once you find, think about which products uh, which companies don't do that, then you can prioritize those instead. But it seems like nowadays there's a lot of research that people have to do just to, just to avoid all these things. Let's see, next question. Scripture says there is no longer a day of ignorance. All will be judged righteously based on every word and deed. We have a way out of damnation through Jesus by repentance and believing him. Not just believing in him, but believing him. Yeah, we definitely don't want to, we want to follow Jesus's example too. We don't just want to believe in him. We want to, he says, those who believe in me will keep my commandments, will do the things that I've instructed. And so when he says like in Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. 
uh, we want to follow that instruction as well, even when it comes to animals. Let's see, Fred. Hi, thanks for joining us. Trust and obedience are always important and needed. Yes. Let's see, Claudia. Uh, let's see. Talking about apples. If you want more information, she provides a link. See, Kathy, we are the family of God, and he tells us to share our burdens with each other and to be our brother's keeper. Yes, uh, those are two good points. So when we pray together and we encourage one another, we want to have this attitude of building each other up. We don't want to tear each other down. We don't want to say, you're a murderer. You murder animals. How can you call yourself a Christian if you're murdering animals? Like, let, let's temper what we say. Let's season it with salt. Let's, let's offer correction with gentleness so that uh, it says God may grant them repentance. And so we want to have the right attitude of, of upbuilding, of encouraging, and we want to be our brother's keeper. Okay, We don't want to uh, think hateful thoughts towards someone, no matter how bad it is that they're, uh, of the things that they're doing. We want to think, okay, well, this is my brother or my sister. I love this person. and But we also want to look at animals that way, that we're the animal's keeper. So we don't want to just turn a blind eye and say, well, I'm going to turn my back on my, my, my animal family members uh, because I don't want to offend or you know, cause a, a stir with my human uh, brothers and sisters who are you know, causing these animal brothers and sisters of mine to... Uh, to be tortured and killed needlessly. So there's definitely a, a kind of a tightrope we have to walk this uh, in order to be gentle and how we make it known to, to those who are causing the suffering, but also having a heart that, that isn't willing to just turn a blind eye to the suffering of the animals. So that's certainly something to, to keep in prayer and to make sure that we ourselves don't fall into that trap of hating our brother because then, you know, we don't want to end up like Cain where having thoughts in our heart of like, well, why, why wouldn't these people, if they would all just die, we don't want to fall into that trap. And so it says we want to be our brother's keeper, both human and animal. So we want to show love and kindness and mercy and gentleness to all of them. Let's see. Um we need to also grow and learn. At some point, we need to wean off the milk um, and delve into the meat of maturity in our relationship with him. Yeah, in that example, obviously, that illustration would be a slightly ironic there that we're getting into the meat when actually we're getting off the meat, literally. But yeah, we want to mature where we're not just thinking of ourselves and not just thinking, well, I'm more important, I'm more valuable, um, so I don't care about animals, it's not, it doesn't matter. We want to instead have that Christ-like servant mentality that says, uh, these animals aren't here to serve me, I'm here to serve them and to show them kindness. Uh, and I want to embody those character traits of Jesus, who's the good shepherd, who looks out for the sheep uh, looks out for the animals, not, you know, destroying them and whatnot. Let's see, Tanya. I used to have temptation, but when I think about how disgust disgusting it is to eat someone's dead body or bodily secretions, it literally makes me ill. Yeah, I think that's a, a common experience that a lot of people have. I know myself included, I also uh, have a similar experience where you know when you're when you're in it you don't really see the absurdity of it and you think well this is just normal because it is normal it's what everyone around us is doing it's just conforming to the ways of the world uh, and these ways of the world are violent especially toward animals and then once you step out of it you know you might be feeling the pull of the temptation where your taste buds haven't really changed yet um, but then like you start thinking wow this is like it's repulsive to me to see a dead body on the table, and it's hard to not see it. And then after a while, uh, once that temptation becomes less and 
you become more more fixed in this in this new mindset and this new lifestyle, and your your taste buds have all uh, undergone a transformation. Then after a while, you kind of look at it, look around, and it's almost like wow, we're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. Everyone's like gnawing on flesh and bone, and so this can be certainly a, a sobering realization for some people. And then the next trick is to to continue to have that uh, that same zeal for God's kingdom and for that that ideal of showing love and mercy to all of our neighbors, even the animals, uh, amidst all of this suffering and amidst all of this apathy and amidst all the ignorance that gives rise to these things being so normal. And so if you're able to maintain that heart and that zeal, even amidst all these things, I think that's uh, that's the key to uh, to really making a difference and making yourself uh, allowing God to make you into that instrument where He can bring about that kind of change. You can be that light to the world. So just remaining with that that gentle mindset of being like, uh, I'm not going to attack people for being this way. I'm going to gently uh, encourage them to do what they ought to do. But yeah, it, uh, once you once you're out of it, and that's why I think that things like the Daniel diet, um, or it's also called like a Daniel fast, where people basically eat a plant based diet for whatever it is, like a month or twenty days or however long they do it for. That's when I feel like it's it's a prime opportunity. And if you know anyone who's doing it, that would be a great time to witness to them on this topic. Start sharing with them FNL talks and be like, you know, because. If you're asking someone, hey, change your, your lifestyle, that's a lot to ask, and people are going to naturally want to say no. But if somebody's already doing it, even if it's only for a short period of time, then to tell them, hey, this thing that you're already doing, here's all the reasons why that's very good and why you should keep doing it and why it's best in God's eyes. Because they don't, because then they've already proven to themselves that they can do it. And so then that, that fallback of, well, that's not possible, well, they don't need to because it's indicating with their own lifestyle what they're doing that it is possible. So if you know anyone who's doing that, um, that would be a great opportunity to try to minister to them in this way to get them to get it to stick. All right, Lily, so true about our motivation. I think that is why people who quit veganism usually didn't actually go vegan, but just went plant-based for a time for health reasons or to lose weight or something. Whereas people go vegan out of love for animals, they don't ever quit. How can we ever go back to harming animals when our motivation is love? Yeah, and I think that, you know, similar to when the scripture, when it talks about once you know the, the love of God and you're transformed, uh, you don't want to return to your old ways. And it says it's like uh, a dog returning to his own vomit. And it's like, we don't want to do that. And when it comes to yeah, like consuming products of animal cruelty. I know one of the ways people tend to go back is through deception. So they'll maybe have something wrong with themselves um, physically, medically, health-wise, and their doctor tells them, well, if you start eating fish or you start consuming cow's milk or whatever other recommendation the doctor gives, it'll help you overcome this problem. And it might but there are other ways to overcome that problem, too, that maybe the doctor isn't aware of. And so they'll be deceived into falling back into these old ways. And so whether you want to say they were never vegan or they were and then they stopped being vegan or however you want to phrase that, uh, we definitely don't want to, to fall back into that. We want to encourage people who are tempted to fall back into it um, to not do that and give them resources be like, look, you're low in iron. Well, here's 25 sources of iron through plants. Um, you don't have to eat animal flesh to get iron or uh, protein. Here's the top 25 plant-based sources of protein where you can get all the protein you need um, and whatever other nutrient they feel they're, they're lacking, how you can get it through plants. All right, so thank you for all your comments tonight. I want to share with you next week's talk. It is, will animals be judged by God? So this talk next week is going to be a little bit, uh, what do you say? It's, it's sort of like a 
theological discussion where I show the two views, and uh, I'm not even personally, I'm not sure which one is correct, but one view is that animals are judged, and the other is that they are not judged, and then the evidence in support of each, each view. And so, of course, one of the natural questions people have is, well, will animals be in heaven? And it's like, well, yes, Scripture says very clearly animals are in heaven. They're depicted in the kingdom. Uh, but then it's like, well, are they the same animals that we knew in our lifetime? And, you know, there are some examples that suggest that at least some of them will be animals we knew in our lifetime. So then the question is, well, do all animals get into heaven or do some get in and some don't? Well, if some do and some don't, then what's the determining reason for why some get in and some don't? And so then there's kind of like all these questions related to that topic that people have. And so that caused us to do a little bit of research on this topic. And so I want to sort of share the results of that research, what those two views are, and let you sort of, you know, come to whatever decision you feel is the, the right reading. But I felt like just kind of going over that topic to kind of point out all the evidence of, of, of how to formulate that view. Because a lot of people, they don't even consider that question because they don't take animals seriously. But once you take animals seriously and think of them as creatures that were designed with, with you know, a consciousness, with uh, feelings, with, with a heart, with uh, the capacity to love and be loved and to praise God, and, you know, then you start taking seriously, well, what's their fate? And how is that determined? So that's kind of what we're going to investigate next week. So it's a bit of a uh, uh, sort of theoretical kind of talk uh, in contrast to today's, which was very sort of practical. Um, but I hope you can join us for that. It should be very interesting. So let's, uh, let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to come together and study this topic and uh, Lord, if there's anyone who who needs help in overcoming this temptation, Lord, we just ask that you give them that strength and that encouragement. And Lord, let us come together to encourage one another as well. And let us come together out of love and gentleness so that we can help each other to, to fulfill your, your very good will and to embody your character and how we treat all of your creation, both human and animal. And Lord, just give us everything that we need. Give us that way of escape when we struggle with temptation and give us uh, uh, the insight to look for that way of escape so that we don't fall for that temptation of the enemy. And Lord, just thank you for, for being here and giving us your word so that we can look to you and your word in everything uh, for, for our own guidance and to guide those around us. So we pray all this and we thank you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining us. God bless. We look forward to seeing you again next week.